It is the end of the 14th century, and life in ancient Singapore was anything but idyllic. Many are trying to save themselves in the last days of a thriving kingdom. Who are these people? What did they have to hide? The answers lay hidden beneath six centuries of soil. Once, this was the seat of power, the resting place of pioneers and people of faith. It's a memory landmark of our childhood years and of our lives in modern times. The hill has seen all of the major events that shaped us into who we are today. From here, we can tell seven centuries of our story, our history from the hills. Located right in the heart of the central business district, this mere 60-metre hill is a prominent yet unnoticed landmark today. A brief respite from the hustle and bustle of the city just nearby. Fort was always very serene. I think it's the way that uh, the, the landscaping, you know, beautiful trees planted by the British. It was, of course, where the governor's house was. So, uh, I think it was an oasis in the city. This small hill is home to some of our most iconic heritage landmarks on the island. Places that hold clues to our past. Singapore history starts and continues around Fort Canning. Fort Canning, in this one location, you have reflections of the entire history of Singapore from the 13th century and the 14th century all the way up to present. Fort Canning itself, in a localized context, is quite strategic. I mean, look, if you look around you right here, we, we're just a stone throws away from Singapore River, the plains. You're looking up at Singapore Harbour, or today is Marina Bay, right? And this is the highest point. You know, apart from the skyscrapers that you see in the 21st century today, uh, this is the highest point. I mean, you know, whoever that lives up here or sits up here has a very commanding view of everything that's happening around them. Fort Canning has become like a chapter of the book that everybody can edit, that everybody can access. This is an epic story that spans across more than 700 years of our history and reveals some unexpected surprises. For decades, experts have been working to uncover a more ancient past than what our history textbooks tell us. Uh, John, can you play something? Something big? Or okay. It's sticking out of the wall. This one. Well, that's a nice green wear, actually. Mm. Mm. Let's get it, and let's see what it looks like. Okay. But actually it's broken. I see, so there's more pieces in there. Yeah. Hey, this is a nice green Long Chuan, 14th century rim shirt. It's a part of a bowl. Uh, you know, so it's actually quite good thick glaze. You see how thick the glaze yeah. is on there? Yeah. Associate Professor John Mixick, who heads the archeology span unit at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, first arrived in the region over 40 years ago. A pioneer in the research of early Southeast Asian history, he was invited here and has been involved in 15 major digs on the island. Along with a few other local experts, he led the first archaeological dig in Singapore on Fort Canning, way back in 1984. Relics unearthed at the sites helped shed light on life in ancient Singapore and put into perspective events that occurred at that time. From porcelain to earthenware to beads and even ancient coins. This overwhelming amount of evidence points to clues of an ancient civilization that existed in what was then known as Bukit Larangan or Forbidden Hill, 500 years before the arrival of the British. Everybody knows, or thinks they know, 
that Singapore, when raffles arrived, had only about 400 people, um, half of whom were Orang Laut, not even living on land, living on boats. And they think it was a, a fishing village and a pirate lair. And they assume that's all it ever had been, had never been anything other than that. And uh, we now know from archaeological excavations that there are half a million artifacts so far which prove the opposite. Fort Canning Hill was the center of the Malay Kingdom of Temasek, in other words, the pre-1819 history of Singapore. That was the center of the island, if you will. That was the center of power. So when the British showed up in 1819, the hill was known as Bukit Larangan, or Forbidden Hill. And that reflected the symbolic importance of the hill. Uh, Average people, the regular people in Singapore, were not supposed to approach it or go upon it. Over at Kent Ridge Laboratory in the National University of Singapore, at the nation's first archaeology unit, volunteers sort through close to half a million artifacts that have been unearthed from not just Fort Canning, but also from the Padang, various smaller sites along the Singapore River, and even underneath the St. Andrew's Cathedral. This is where the majority of the items which have not been processed yet come in. So this is stuff that's just been washed but not yet sorted out, classified at all. So the first thing we do after cleaning them is to sort them out into different categories, into the different time periods and also into the different types of material. Now, we'll never be able to date precisely the first settlement of Singapore from archaeological remains. They're a bit too, um, there's too much uh, uh, uncertainty there. But in terms of the proximate beginning of the 14th century, that fits in perfectly. Because our archaeological remains begin to appear right around 1300. It's almost exactly what the millennials would say. And we know from Chinese sources that by 1320 or so, Singapore already had a ruler who is sending diplomatic missions to China. Artifacts unearthed here point to the existence of a palace on top of the hill, home to ancient royalty who lived in what was then known as Tamase, the early name for Singapore. This royal palace was located in what is now the Fort Canning Service Reservoir on the hill. We have very few documents about early Malay palaces. The closest thing we have to any picture of a 14th century Malay wooden building is from Jambi in Sumatra, which was the old kingdom of Malayu. There are some bricks from some of the Buddhist temples there which actually have carvings on them of wooden buildings. And they look kind of like Minangkabau houses with a kind of curving roof. And they have several different compartments, it looks like, and high they stand up high on the secondary foundation. Uh, we, we can be pretty sure that they were built out of wood. Fort Canning Hill was quite distinctive in its outline, and it stood up right near the seashore. So one way of locating yourself was to look at the outlines of the hills, and Fort Canning was really useful for that. So just as a kind of a navigational device, it was quite good. And it was also high enough that people out there could see out to sea pretty far. It was very useful, first of all, as a landmark, and second of all, it was very important because of its height. And all the early Malay palaces were built on exactly the same kind of site. So, very obviously, Singapore was, like it is today, an emporium, uh, triple, where people came to exchange, sell, buy goods. Ancient Singapore was a flourishing port city with a palace situated on top of the hill and a bustling trading network along the Singapore River. Back on Bukit Larangan, a few people would bury something so unique that it would shed much light on the inhabitants of the island 700 years later. A valuable time capsule from the 14th century, unearthed in Fort Canning. Gold. <laughs> 
Amongst the thousands of artifacts found in Fort Canning, a few gold artifacts were found that date back to the 14th century. One of the most intriguing ones was a gold armlet that was perhaps used by kings and queens of this bygone era. This gold armlet was part of a cachet of ornaments that was found back in 1928 by the British when work on the reservoir in the area began. These artifacts allow John Mixick an unprecedented look at the lives of the people in 14th century Singapore. Right here. That building there, that is where the artifacts were discovered in 1928. Those artifacts are the most valuable items ever discovered in Singapore. And it is another very strong piece of evidence suggesting that's where the palace was. That's the kind of gold jewelry that would only have been worn by a high king or a very close relative of the nobles. So it suggests that that was within the actual area of the palace itself. They wouldn't have gone far away to bury it, maybe just out in the backyard or something. So the palace must have stood very near to this point. Uh, but it's likely that there was somebody who was fleeing from an attack and they just had time to bury things very shallow depth and then they fled and they never were able to come back, either because they died or because they didn't dare to come back to Singapore. Found right by the side of the service reservoir on top of the hill, this and the thousands of other artifacts reveal the scale of life in ancient Singapore. We have a lot of evidence of pretty significant sophistication in terms of the everyday items used by the population of Singapore, the use of money at a very early stage, of the range of occupations, the complexity, in other words, of life here. Also, the, the connections with many other countries, imports of lots of things from all over. There is also a place on the hill that reveals some of the identities of the people who have lived here 700 years ago. Located on the south side of Fort Canning Hill, this Kramat or tomb in Malay was built to honour the memory of Sultan Iskandar Shah, the last king of ancient Singapore. He ruled Singapore for three years before fleeing north. His name was Paramiswara. But this tomb itself may not have been an actual grave. In 1819, when Raffles landed and uh, Fort Canning Hill was Bukit Larangan, or the Forbidden Hill, when the British, uh, various British officers went up to the hill, what they found was a series of Kramat sites. And at the time, it was believed that it wasn't only Iskandar Shah who was buried there, but also other important members of the kind of Malay myth and stories around the founding of Malay society. I don't believe anyone is buried at the Kramat. I think of it more as a symbol of this pre-1819 Malay history. It's kind of the culmination of all the different factors that come together. We dug down about two meters. <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing beneath the Kramat. So whatever had been there before, whether that brick structure or a tomb or anything, was completely wiped out by the later Kramat reconstructions. Probably every 10 or 20 years they did some kind of rebuilding on that site. There are many different kinds of ways you can be judged a Kramat. There are Kramats with bodies. Um, probably how you know is one of the best examples. And there used to be about 40 or 50 in Singapore, and they were all burials. So then people seem to have assumed that that's all it could ever be. But if you go to Sumatra and Java, or even to the Near East, you also find Kramats, which are not, not burials. Evidences of who may have lived here on Fort Canning Hill during the time of Damase can be traced to a 16th century text called the Sajara Melayu, or the Malay Annals. It was one of the few recorded texts of the time. Associate Professor Timothy Barnard has studied the contents of this text for more than 10 years. And some characters that are depicted in the book 
are quite prominent in our nation's history. In the Sajara Malayu, Sang Nila Utama is a prince who is coming from Sumatra. And he arrives in uh, the region, in a, in a sense, in the, in the Riau archipelago. And he decides to go uh, hunting one day. And they go to a nearby island, which is known as Temasek. And the rest, as they always say, is history. And when he is heading toward Timasek, he, for example, sees a lion, which then lends itself to the name Singapura, Singa meaning lion. And so it is the origin tale that explains the name of our nation today. But here's the problem. There were no lions in Singapore at the time. And the name Singapura probably did not come from Sang Nila Utama. The story goes that a prince from Palembang came here in the 13th century. He saw a lion and named the area Singapura. Sang Nila Utama never saw a lion. If he did see a large animal, it was most likely a tiger. But once again, I don't think that's important. What's important is the, the metaphor, the idea of what a lion represented, which would be kingship and the special nature of these kings in this land. The reality more likely is that within the religion of the day, which was Bahayana Buddhism, and the king, the rulers, were considered an incarnation of a bodhisattva, a Buddha to come person. So he lands on Singapore and decides that this will be the new seat, location of his lion throne, which then gives the name Singapura. There was most likely someone who came, probably from Sumatra, to help develop a port, a kingdom here on Timasek. Whether his name was Sangni Lutama, Paramasvari, Sri Tribwana, uh, we don't know. Uh, it would be nice if it was, but in reality, we, we will never know. Associate Professor John Mixick tells us there is much more to the identity of our island than what the Sajara Malayu tells us. Surprisingly, there are in fact more than one place called Singapura in the region's history. Now, the first historical reference to Singapore in Southeast Asia is actually way down here. And it's on the east coast of Vietnam. It's not that far away from the oldest writing in Southeast Asia, which is just here. From here, it goes down to the Malay Peninsula, pops up again about 300, 400 years later, this area of what is now Patani, the Malay-speaking area of South Thailand. And then it shifts up here to the mainland, to the central area of Thailand, which had been Buddhist before under the Dwarawati Kingdom. So Dwarawati going all the way back to the 7th, 8th century was a big Buddhist area. Then of course it uh, pops up here down in the island of Tamasek, becoming Singapura, which was definitely Mahayana Buddhist at this period, throughout the 14th century. Because as the Malay now say, the Malay rulers only converted to Islam after they moved to Malacca from Tamasek in the early 1400s. Uh, so it's no doubt that the Singaporeans at this time were Mahayana Buddhist. His research has led us to understand that the name Singapura is not exclusive to our island. It had existed before in ancient Vietnam, then in South Thailand, the Kingdom of Siam, and eventually where we are today. It was a, a auspicious name, obviously. Um, lions were always symbols in Buddhism of uh, supreme power and wisdom, uh, enlightenment. Um, the voice of the king often was seen as being as the roar, loud as the roar of the lion. The, the king's throne often was called Singhasana, the lion throne. And you find these, at least in India, um, of thrones carved in the shape of lions. So um, 
So all this together means just, again, it's another rebranding exercise from a local name, Tomasik, to a name, uh, Singapura in Sanskrit, which again would have been intelligible to the international merchant community. The kingdom of Tomasik prospered for over a hundred years, but its days were numbered. There are a few versions to this story. They may have been an invasion by the forces of the Majapahit Empire nearby in the name of conquest. Others believe that Siamese forces attacked Tomasi nearing the end of the 14th century. They drove the ruler Paramaswara and the people out of the island, ending almost a hundred years of rule in ancient Singapore. The record suggests or can be interpreted to suggest that Singapore in the 14th century was abandoned because it was caught between two emerging regional forces, that of the East Javanese uh, Empire of Majapahit and the Thai Kingdom of uh, Ayutthaya. Over time, the stories of the Kingdom of Tomase and Bukit Larangan would become legends that many have forgotten. But Associate Professor John Mixick is still trying to claim what is rightfully ours. I think archaeology is really important for Singapore history and identity because the Singaporeans mostly think that there was nobody here, nothing happening 200 years ago, and that therefore Singapore has a short history and no identity, no character. It's still just a mishmash of different sources. Whereas archaeology combined with these kinds of semi-mythological sources indicates that Singapore has a much longer time span. And as some famous Singapore politicians have said, that history is very important. Um, Roger Ratnam said this, for example, that history is important in defining what a Singaporean is, and what a Singapore identity should be. So why would any person cut out the three quarters of their own brain? Why would you cut off most of your memory and only leave the, like, the last 28% of it or something like that? But the last 200 years are only about 28% of Singapore's history. 72% goes back further than that. 400 years after the fall of Tomasi, another group of people arrived. They would remove almost all traces of our ancient past and develop policies that would change the landscape and mindset of the people. The colonial era had begun.